All right, so I guess I'll take it from here. Uh, thank you so much for joining this uh, workshop uh, on automated uh, machine learning and uh, I guess more particularly in deep learning. And I hope everyone online can hear me okay. Uh, if not, please uh, feel free to let me know. And uh, at any point, feel free to raise uh, any questions if you have them. Um, I guess for, for this workshop, we'll be mostly doing this two-day applied course for building convolutional neural networks and uh, automated machine learning in genomics. So what I mean by applied is that we're mostly focusing on the code implementations. Okay, and with just a high level understanding of what's like the theoret theoretical understanding. Um, and by CNNs, I hope you already are sort of uh, heard of that before, which stands for the convolutional neural network is a specific type of deep learning models that are particularly good at uh, handling and learning spatial patterns. So the jargon here is a spatial inductive bias, which we'll cover more uh, in the slides, uh, in the next few slides. And the automated machine learning, which is typically has this acronym of AutoML, stands for this process of automating the design process of deep learning. And we'll all mostly cover that part in the second day of this workshop. And uh, last but not least, we're applying all those techniques to genomics, which means that our input will be DNA sequences and we'll output not just a model, but more importantly, uh, the biological insights we can learn by building those models. So the goal of this workshop is first uh, understand how CNNs work uh, in order to model the genomic sequences. Uh, and of course, we also want to understand the basic concepts and components uh, when you try to automate this uh, CNN building process. We'll implement CNNs in two popular deep learning frameworks, that is uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow so that you will be able to choose between those two frameworks and see which one you like for the future research. Uh, we'll also try to implement a prototype of automated machine learning in a Python package called Ember. Uh, and Ember is developed by me and it's uh, designed to be framework agnostic. So you can use either TensorFlow or a PyTorch as the backend. And finally, we will implement the basic model explanation techniques. Uh, as I mentioned, because we're working with uh, biomedicine and genomics, it's important to understand what sort of evidence we're using uh, for the models to make prediction and what kind of uh, insights we can learn. So for day one, which is today, we will mostly be building the CNNs uh, using those two popular uh, deep learning frameworks and also uh, touch base on how we can evaluate different models. Um, and in the second day, we will work on automated machine learning and model explanation techniques. Uh, by this process of AutoML, we're actually using a specific type of learning technique called reinforcement learning and uh, neural architecture search. And uh, eventually we'll interpret the best, the most accurate model uh, and, and uh, try to identify the sequence motif, DA sequence motifs that is being utilized by the model to make the predictions. So um, the entire uh, workshop, the coding part is uh, mostly implemented in Google Colab, uh, which hopefully you received the emails I sent you yesterday and you were able to uh, briefly uh, get familiar with how it works. So, so uh, this GitHub repository link is already uh, sent out in the email I sent yesterday, but if you didn't receive that, uh, it's also on the screen. So if you go to this GitHub repository, uh, you should be able to find this uh, the day one Jupyter notebook. Um, and from there, if you, yeah, what's up? They're not able to see this? Okay. Oh. It's, uh... Okay, can someone online tell me if you were able to see the screen? Yeah, now I can see it. All right. Yeah, so I guess I'll have to back up a little bit. Um, basically, this is a two-day workshop. And in the first day, we'll use uh, 
two popular deep learning frameworks to build uh, a simple convolutional neural networks. Uh, those two types of uh, deep learning frameworks are first uh, TensorFlow, which has been popular for for the last decade almost, and PyTorch, which is uh, really gaining catching up and gaining popularity uh, in the past uh, three to five years, and uh, especially popular in the research field. Um, and uh, in the second day, we'll take this to the next level and find the most the most accurate uh, CNN model using this simulated data uh, through this process called neural architecture search and uh, to automate CNN tuning. And uh, the underlying theory behind it is called reinforcement learning. So basically, we can use a, a artificial neural network to replace as an agent to replace this uh, human manual tuning process. And uh, once we find the best, the most accurate model, we'll try to interpret uh, the model's uh, decision process and uh, discover the sequence motifs that uh, are useful for the model to make such a prediction. So uh, as I mentioned, the entire coding part of this uh, workshop is already posted online in this GitHub repository. So the link is here. You can go to this URL. It's publicly available. And you should first for today, you should find this uh, Jupyter notebook uh, with the name UCLA AutoML Workshop Day One. Okay, so when you click on that, uh, you will be able to see this icon open in Colab at the very top. So if you click click that, this will take you um, to to a new Google Colab uh, window where you can interactively in, interactively run this uh, tutorial. So it's actually very fast. It's designed to be very fast to run through the entire coding part, right? Because we have limited time. Right? Most of the time people think about deep learning, you think about like training for weeks or even months, but uh, this is designed to be fast. And uh, basic coding implementations is already implemented. So the way it works is that uh, at each uh, break, I will put, uh, put up the practice for that, that specific section. And after running the basic coding part, uh, you should try to code on your own to answer those practice questions. Um, this will really help you get a deeper understanding of this particular section. Um, this is what I mean by the explore the practice questions shown in the slides. And I was told that uh, there are people who are taking this workshop as part of their course credits. So for if you are uh, taking this uh, to account for course credits, uh, at, by the end of each day, there are five extended practice questions following each day's uh, notebook. So your coding implementations to those five extended practices uh, will be graded. Um, and uh, each practice is worth 10 points, it's equally distributed, and the total is uh, 100 points. Um, but uh, just one hint is that they are not all of the same difficulty level. So uh, be strategic in terms of uh, time management. So for people who are taking this for cost credits, you should complete the coding assignments uh, in the Google Colab, which is this uh, reproducible online um, cloud-based platform and save a copy either in GitHub or in your Google Drive. And then uh, send me your results by next Friday uh, so so that I can view your results and uh, grade them. Just a, a, a quick reminder that to, when you send it, uh, change the permission to anyone with a link to view it so that uh, you don't send me a link that I can't open. So, all right, so without further ado, let's get to the first day of our workshop, which is uh, build CNNs and model evaluations. I guess I, I forgot to introduce myself. So basically, uh, yeah, my name is Frank Zhang, and I'm a faculty member at Cedar Sinai Medical Center. Uh, I started my own group last year, uh, during the summer of last year, um, and uh, AutoML has been one of uh, my most uh, interest uh, research directions, and I'm really happy to teach this workshop. So just as a quick recap, um, machine learning. I hope most of you are already familiar with it or you have taken the workshop uh, by UCLA QC Bao uh, a few weeks ago, which is uh, machine learning with Python. But basically, if you go, you just Google it, well, most uh, of the results will tell you machine learning refers to um, something that gives computers the ability to learn without 
explicitly explicitly program, but it didn't really tell you how they were able to do this. So the reason why machine learning can learn without being explicitly programmed is because they are originated from statistical learning. So here I'm showing a very uh, classy example where we have uh, three types of different iris flowers. And uh, some uh, botanists can measure the length and the width of both petals and uh, sepals, right? So these are considered as the features for different types of flowers. And then we can build a statistical model. And it, in this uh, specific case, this is, this is a logistic regression. And uh, in simple probabilistic language, we're trying to predict given the observed petal and the uh, sepal, right? So what's the probability of this specific uh, flower being uh, one of those three types, right? We can formulate this probability by a sigmoid function that depends linearly on the combination of petal and sepal. So by learning those beta values, we can, whenever we observe a new flower with a specific petal and sepal, we can make a prediction probabilistically, right? So for example, here, uh, we, build, we learn those betas uh, to see that if the petal length is very small, it's more likely to be one of those, uh, I think it's a setosa versus some other types of flowers. And uh, this process of learning those betas uh, is called statistical learning. And, uh, but how are we actually going to optimize the betas? So the approach is called maximum likelihood. So, you know, in a nutshell, we can learn those betas by gradient descent. So the goal here is to, we want to optimize, the optimization goal here is we want to maximize the likelihood on the observed feature label pair, pairs. So remember the features are the petals and sepals, the length and width. And the labels is one of those three types of flowers. So what we can do is we can iteratively uh, update those betas, which is the parameters of our statistical model by a small amount so that the model's likelihood will increase slightly. So here are some uh, like very, uh, uh, the actual equation for doing this uh, gradient update. Basically in each uh, iteration T, uh, we can uh, increase the value or decrease the value by a small amount uh, eta that, so that the likelihood will increase. And uh, the form is, of this is also very interesting. So basically we're taking the difference between your current prediction and the actual true labels. And then you add this difference to your previous betas. Uh, that is your next iteration of beta. And this eta, which is considered as learning rate, controls how much you want to jiggle uh, from your current set of uh, betas. So I hope this is uh, not too much. Um, and uh, you've uh, heard of this previously, uh, but basically this is where this uh, whole idea of machine learning originates by learning some model parameters from the, from the data. And um, since then, there are people who are thinking that uh, statistics, machine learning, and the deep learning, also known as artificial intelligence, are just a fancy words of one another. So if you look at this uh, cartoon here, if you frame this problem as uh, statistics, um, it's just uh, like a crack on the wall. But if you put a frame on it and call it uh, machine learning, suddenly it becomes an art. And uh, now if you call the same thing as artificial intelligence, now you have this big audience uh, and group of people who are interested in it. So there are certain, some level of uh, truth to this cartoon, but uh, for the most part, um, they're certainly closely connected as, as I just mentioned. But uh, since, they're, uh, since the coin, coin of those names, they also have developed important and specialized subfields so that nowadays they're not the same thing anymore. And uh, to demonstrate this, let's first look at the most basic form of uh, deep neural networks. So at that time, they're called multi-layered perceptrons. So perceptrons refers to those different um, hidden neurons. So in the most basic form, DNNs are just a stacks of uh, logistic regressions. So remember this logistic regression is the process of uh, 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 formulating the labels as a set of linear combinations from the features, uh, which we just covered. And in this specific case, um, uh, 
uh, this this deep neural network will basically stacked around a number of 100 logistic regressions in this uh, blue hidden layer, where each of those a single neuron is actually the same logistic regression that we just covered for predicting the type of flowers. Uh, so this is the most basic form, but since then they have some special forms uh, originated from this uh, vanilla deep neural networks. So one of the most popular ones is called convolutional neural networks. So CNNs are special types of DNs that are good at learning local spatial patterns. So for example, if you look at this example here, um, this is actually published uh, as a peer reviewed article where basically they take this input flower image and uh, use convolutional neural networks to learn the image patches so that we don't need to manually measure the paddle and sample length anymore. So this model uh, will automatically learn those features through this uh, feature extraction process uh, where uh, each of those convolutions will look at a small image patch and uh, scan it through this entire image. So, so this, of course, it's very efficient that uh, this feature expression process is fully automated and data-driven, so we don't have to uh, manually measure paddle and sample length anymore. But um, it's still quite challenging to actually understand what sort of image patterns are actually being used by the model to make a prediction. And in contrast, um, applying CNNs in genomics are actually very straightforward to interpret what sort of evidence is being used. So as an example, what I'm showing here is uh, the same type of a convolutional neural network, but applied on genomics. So the difference between a DNA sequence and an image is that a DNA sequence is a uh, one dimensional, right? So it only goes from, uh, uh, like say the five prime end to the three prime end. Versus uh, in images, you can have the height and the width, right? So that's considered as a two dimensional CNN. Um, so despite, Besides this subtle difference, uh, most of the part of the CNN works uh, almost the same. So basically we input this uh, DNA sequence uh, that goes through the convolutions. The convolutions will represent some sort of uh, DNA mo sequence motifs. And, uh, um, and then we can, again, there's no need to manually extract which, what kind of uh, sequence motifs are there. And we can use those automatically discovered patterns to make predictions. And uh, indeed, it has been shown that uh, convolutional neural networks are very highly efficient uh, to predict a variety of uh, molecular vari variations based on the DNA sequences. Um, so historically, CNNs are probably first developed to predict the epigenetic markers because they are the biochemical modifications uh, that are inherent in DNAs. But later, they were introduced uh, to different types of uh, molecular variations such as enhancer predictions uh, or gene expressions based on the DNA sequence and uh, migrated to both like RNA splicing, processing like uh, polyadenylations and then more recently to, to um, protein problems. So here as an example, we can actually input the entire human genome as the input to your CNN model and try to predict one of those 22,000 epigenetic markers of, uh, as a measured by chromatin profiles. So this set of comprehensive 22,000 chromatin profiles can really very comprehensively characterize the, um, the specific uh, features for any given chunk of DNAs. And aside from that, we can also use the same type of uh, method to predict uh, things that are not inherent to human genome. For example, to CRISPR, if we want to uh, apply CRISPR-Cas9 to edit a certain type of certain chunk of DNA sequence, we can use that to predict the editing outcomes um, of this DNA sequence. So my point here is that as long as you have an input that is a uh, sequence-like and you will try to predict, characterize some sort of uh, molecular activities that are associated with this uh, sequence, regardless if it's inherently as uh, epigenetic markers or as a uh, genome editing, uh, repair outcomes, CNNs will be a very powerful choice. 
So aside from these uh, accurate predictions, I guess the most important thing that makes the CNs different from uh, other machine learning methods is that we can use it to interpret the functional genetic variations. So genetic variations basically means the mutations that are inherent in the human population, uh, as well as during some uh, mutagenesis of process such as cancer. So in this specific case, uh, the central dogma already established that the causality flows from the DNA to downstream molecular, uh, molecular phenotypes. And uh, with the CN model, now we can actually introduce artificially or in silicon mutations to any DNA sequence that uh, we would like. So importantly, like in, in a natural human population, uh, there are certain mutation types that are extremely rare, right? So you, you, we don't have the power, statistical power to understand uh, whether we, what's the actual consequences of this mutation. But because of this uh, CNN model, we can actually introduce infinite number of uh, mutations and their combinations to our prediction and assess their, whether this mutation is mu neutral, uh, pathogenic, uh, or actually it will enhance and brings a fitness, uh, better fitness effect. So in this particular example here, for example, this reference genome, which is, you can consider this as an average person has this uh, genome sequence like this, and we can predict if you apply a CRISPR-Cas9 to this chunk of this uh, sequence, we can likely introduce 90% of the frame shift and knock out this particular gene. But in certain uh, subpopulations, maybe this part of the C will be mutated to an A, right? So uh, in this alternative or single nucleotide variation genome, we can again apply the same CNN model and this will tell us like the most likely there's only 40% of the chance that uh, CRISPR-Cas9 can introduce the frame shift. So this will, what does this tell us? This tells us that uh, by just changing this one letter in your DNA sequence, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 can have a very different, dramatically different uh, gene knockout efficiency. So this can give us insights of uh, whether this will be a good target to apply CRISPR-Cas9 in the presence of uh, different mutations and genetic variations. So I guess as a summary, why CNNs are super powerful, especially in genomics, is because we can now enable this end-to-end -end modeling. Basically, we just input the DNA sequence without any manual feature engineering. And uh, it's very flexible. As I mentioned, it started as a predicting epigenetic markers, but it later extended to different types of uh, molecular phenotypes. And uh, I guess most importantly is because it gives us the, the ability to assess the mutation effects. So next we will study how to implement this CNA in a step-by-step -step guide. So any questions so far? So if not, I will, let's continue. So as I mentioned, uh, the input for this our CN model is just the raw genomic sequence. We don't do any feature engineering. But uh, in order for CNs to understand a DNA sequence, uh, we still there's only one step that we need to do, which is convert the sequence into a one-hot encoded matrix. So the reason why this is called a one-hot encoded matrix is because you can see the matrix only have zero and ones. It's a binary matrix. And uh, we will encode the different DNA letters, A, C, G, and T, as different channels. So uh, as shown in this uh, slide, you can see the first channel is A. So whenever you see an A in your input DNA sequence, you put a one zero. And then all the rest of this uh, base pair will be zero. Okay. so. For the C channel, uh, if you see a C letter, DNA letter in your input sequence, you put a one there, and then the rest of them will be zero. Again, this is why it's called one hot encoded. And then uh, conventionally, people will call this, this direction as the feature dimension. Uh, the reason is that this feature dimension is actually spatially ordered, right? So um, how to say? 
So on this spatially ordered dimension, feature dimension or spatial dimension, if you shift your input sequence, it doesn't change the meaning of your of your input. So basically, if I shift this uh, CGA from here uh, by one nucleotide, this CGA still stands for the same sequence motifs. So this is also called the permutation invariant property of CNNs, right? So that's why we're, because CNNs only look at a spatial patch. If you move your input from this feature dimension, it doesn't change the meaning of your input. However, if you look at the channel dimension, you can, this dimension is actually fixed. We can't switch that. Uh, the reason being that if you see uh, A in this channel, if you change that to C, apparently that changes the meaning of your input DNA sequence. Just keep that in mind because we will get back to here later. And uh, I guess the, this uh, is, the, is the basics of uh, machine learning, which is the train validation test data split. Hopefully you have already learned about this in your, I think in the previous, uh, workshop, but very, very briefly, uh, we always want to randomly count out a portion of our labeled uh, data in order to evaluate how our model can generalize to unseen data. Okay, so for many uh, statistical methods, just counting out, for example, logistic regression, uh, just counting out the test data set sometimes will be enough. But for deep learning, because it's so powerful, it's so easy to overfit, uh, we additionally need to count out a set of this validation data uh, for the purpose of tuning hyperparameters and assessing overfitting uh, during the training process. You will be able to uh, see that uh, in your coding practice. And uh, just a word of caution, right? So when you do this test validation, ta uh, train validation test split, uh, you should always be looking out for potential data leakage. And uh, in real data sets, we typically will hold out uh, an entire one or two chromosomes to ensure that there is no overlap between our training validation and testing data set. But uh, in our specific case, we're actually working on a simulated data, so we don't need to worry about that uh, right now. Okay, so let's now start our practice one. So if you go to the GitHub repository, find the day one Jupyter notebook, uh, you can start a new runtime uh, on the cloud. And uh, I want you to run from the beginning till the end of uh, section one, low data and uh, train test split. All right, so as, I, as we talked about earlier, running through these code sections are very fast. Uh, so if you have done that, please look at these uh, three additional questions and try to understand um, how the data looks like. So for this section, the practices are mostly focused on exploratory data analysis which is uh, the aim is to help you understand um, some basic characteristics of your input data, such as um, uh, the proportions of positive and negative in your uh, input labels and whether they're balanced or not balanced. Uh, this is really, really important in practice uh, when you are dealing with uh, real world data, which is much, much noisier. And uh, in the last one, I want you to write a function uh, to convert the one hot encoded matrix that we just uh, uh, covered back to the DNA sequence and, and from the DNA sequence convert back to the one hot encoded matrix. Because in this uh, notebook, they are already compiled as one hot encoded matrix as the input data. Okay, so you have uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And if you have any questions, um, you can either ask me or I think there's a, Sorry, can you explain how yep. it's one hot encoded to eight ATP? Because I, I see that the data it's. Yes. Oh, okay, so each. Um, it's like a bunch of four element vectors. So like each position. It's like a four element vector that represents ATP. Yes. And uh, in this particular case, they are ordered exactly as A, C, G, and T. Uh, basically the, the, the data that you will download. Yeah, can you have a structure to the data? Um, or is it just a list of four 
Uh, so in your in the original input data when you download from a uh, from the GitHub repository, uh, that's just uh, the apps and well, right? And that's apps if they were a feature is like for elements, they say four by and matrix, and the Y's will be this uh binary label zero ones. No, right now, no. yes, that's a very, that's a very posture, yes. Yeah, but in real data, like when you go active process your own, like say I think that chip take data. There will be a lot of uh, external metadata associated with each feature label pair. And you want to, uh, when you do this split, you want to tell that certain protocol. So I see a question online to explain what is data leakage. So data leakage is uh, actually pretty simple. So if you think about it, the reason why we hold out uh, some data as the testing data is to is we want to evaluate how our model performs on this unseen data, right? So something that is never been seen by the model during the training process. But if you have the data leakage, which means there are some overlaps between your training data and your testing data, that's what we call as data leakage because you know that your training data is leaking to the testing data, then this testing doesn't serve our purpose of evaluating the model's performance on the unseen data. For example, okay. also, if you go to the very end of uh, the slide deck where we have this QA, write your questions in this Google Doc. Uh, I believe you should be able to put your questions there as well, uh, just in case you know I, I miss your questions um, in a Zoom chat or you want to ask something offline. Okay.
All right, so I guess I'm just gonna ask how how is the implementation going? Were you able to get any of the three practices working? Yep. And uh, for people who are online, I would also appreciate your feedbacks or if you have any questions, always feel free to ask. Okay, so I guess that's for this part of the practice. So if you didn't have the time to finish everything uh, during this time period, that's okay. You can always, uh, the, the slide deck is there. You can always uh, go back and find those practice questions uh, in the GitHub repository. So next we'll move on to actually understand which part of uh, what, which part of the convolution your network is doing uh, and uh, What's the underlying intuitions behind that? So apparently, like for CNNs, the most important part is uh, is the convolution layers. So for each convolution layers, we have this convolutional kernel matrix, which is uh, analogous to the set of betas, which is the uh, logistic regression coefficients that we covered earlier. Um, but in particular, each convolutional kernel matrix can be translated into something very biologically related, which is a, a motif positional weight matrix. So how many of you have seen this type of a, a motif visualization here? Okay, so uh, basically this, uh, the letters, the size of the letter uh, indicates how important, um, how important it is uh, a DNA letter is for this particular location. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you for this particular motif, CCG gives you the highest score because you can see uh, C, C, and G have this positive bits. Uh, and uh, there's there are also certain DNA letters that will be penalized, uh, meaning that if you see another letter other than C on the first location, that will disrupt certain binding, for example, a binding of transfer factor. Um, so if you see a G there, you get a negative score. So typically uh, in genomics, this type of information is called motifs, sequence motifs, because we are ex expecting a certain order of the DNA letters uh, along this DNA sequence. And uh, the actual like probability distribution of uh, observing different DNA letters is called those positional weight matrix. And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, a motif positional weight matrix to a convolutional kernel. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, this CCG motif can be translated into a kernel matrix uh, that may look like this, right? So basically those highlight, highlighted solid colors represents um, the letters that gives you a positive score, which probably means that, uh, that it will increase the likelihood that uh, your transfer factor will bind to a DNA sequence versus all the rest of those letters will have a penalty, right? So it's a negative 0 0.5, meaning that if you see not a C represent, remember this is the channel dimension, A, C, G, and T, and they are color matched. So if you don't see a C in the first position, but instead see an A, this will decrease uh, the binding probability by some like 0 0.5 to some uh, arbitrary scales. Okay, so the the parameters in this convolutional layer is basically this convolutional kernel. And uh, each of those numbers are analogous to the betas that we discussed uh, during logistic regression, right? So basically those are learned from the beta through some gradient descent. So suppose we already know the ground truth, we know the convolutional kernels matrix. So how are we actually applying this convolutional kernel uh, to scan an uh, input DNA sequence? So um, the intuition is very simple. So because the CNNs only look at a small local patch of your DNA se sequence input, uh, so basically we will scan these kernels from left to right. And uh, at each step, sliding step, we will compute the sum of element-wise multiplications. 
So you might already notice that we have a four channels for our input DNA sequence. We also have four channels for our convolutional kernel. So they are matched. And uh, here, like in those first sliding window, we're basically computing uh, the element-wise multiplications of these two matrix. And remember that our DNA sequence input is one hot encoded. So in this illustration here, the solid colors means they are ones, all the rest are zeros. So if you match this kernel to this first three nucleotides, so basically you are summing up for one times one plus one times one plus 0 0.5 times one. So that gives you a convolution score of 2.5. So this will be the first, uh, first step output for your convolution operation. And then in the next step, you will slide this convolution kernel matrix one base pair to the next position. So you can probably do this by yourself, but now we only have one matched C's here and uh, the rest does not match anymore. So this will decrease your uh, output score from this convolution operation. And um, if you compute that, this is going to be zero. All right, so if you further slide this, to the very last position of our input DNA sequence, then we don't have any matched nucleotides anymore, right? So it's not CCG. Um, so when you have these dis mismatches, uh, you will be strongly penalized. So the output score will be negative 1.5. So guys, I want to put a special note on these output dimensions throughout this uh, convolution operation. So you can, think, you can see that our input, remember this CCGAT is our feature dimension, right? They are spatially ordered. So the output dimension is basically the, our input feature dimension, which is five minus the kernel size. So the kernel size is the how much of the local sliding window size you're looking at at each step. In this case, it's, it's three because it's CCG, right? So the output dimension is basically input dimension feature, input feature dimension size minus the kernel size plus one. So the output will be three numbers for this convolutional kernel size, a kernel matrix. And uh, just to emphasize this again, this channel dimensions is ACG and T, they're fixed. So if you switch two rows in this channel dimension, your input will mean totally different things, right? So you can't switch A to C. However, there, there is, here you can precisely see why this feature dimension is a permutation invariant, because we are sliding this convolutional kernel matrix from left to right. So if you also slide your input sequence by a few base pairs, so the sliding operation will still account for those local dependencies. So the output for this part of the sequence will still be uh, 2.50 and negative 1.5. This is why it's called permutation bond. You can switch this along this uh, spatial dimension, okay? So what we just covered is just the convolution operation for one kernel matrix. In reality, we can have multiple convolution kernels, right? So, uh, so for example, what we just covered is CCG, um, uh, that will gives you an output of a vector, right? So a vector of a, a three numbers. So when you have a second convolution kernels, for example, this CAG, uh, you can also just do the same identical operations. And uh, this kernel will give you, again, three numbers, but uh, different three numbers, depending on your input sequence. And in this case, it's a 0 0.50 and negative 0 0.5. So, in real world uh, convolutional neural networks, you will have multiple convolutional kernel matrix, each giving you a vector of uh, numbers. Um, so again, going back to the not notations of the shapes, so suppose our input size is this CCGAT, which feature dimension is five, five base pairs, and the channel is always four. So in this particular case, we added one kernel matrix. So in a in jargon, this is called the number of filters. So number of filters refers to how many kernel matrix you have. All right, so in this case, we have two filters. 
and each with a kernel size of three. So the output for a convolutional layer with two filters will be, uh, the feature dimension will be three. As I just mentioned, it's uh, five minus three plus y. And the channel dimension now becomes two because you have a two uh, different convolutional kernel matrix, each of that giving you a, a vector. So when you have two filters, you get this uh, two by three matrix. And uh, there's a specific name for this two by three matrix, which is called a feature map. So a feature map will always return the same channel dimension. The meaning of a channel dimension and a feature dimensions, um, but they are apparently dependent on how many convolutional kernel matrices you have in your CNN model. Yes, that's true. And to Yes. Yeah, but uh, yes. This is only when, for better simplicity in terms of uh, illustrations, we only have uh, two uh, kernel matrix. In reality, like most of the time, you will actually have uh, like uh, tens or hundreds of uh, kernel matrices. So in essence, that will enlarge your channel from four to say 100. And uh, this process can obviously like enlarge the information that are contained uh, from your original input because you only have four and a half, 100. Um, yeah, so any other questions for this convolution? Because this is super, super important. <laughs> this is why CNNs are called convolutional neural networks. Um, and I hope that by this point, uh, you sh it should be fairly clear that why we denote this feature dimension versus uh, channel dimension, why uh, we have this uh, permutation environments. Okay, so if you have other questions, always feel free to write down in the Google Doc. Um, yeah, that's right, but not very uh, 100 precise. So basically feature dimension, uh, it's not just the input feature, it's also like you go through this dimension that is your feature or spatial, maybe it's spatial dimension, they're, they're used interchangeably. So spatial dimension may be more, Less, less confusing. So spatial dimension is basically you can move along this spatial dimension. So the meaning of your input sequence doesn't change. And the, the reason is that, yes, yes, exactly. That's why like uh, during our illustration of uh, this flower example, these betas are being updated iteratively. Okay, and uh, again, like the reason why this is permutation invariant is because we are sliding this kernel uh, sequentially along this spatial dimension. So if you also uh, slide your input sequence, as long as like the other is the same, it's always CCGAT. When you slide through this CCGAT, you are always going to get the same output. Okay, so uh, if that's good, let's move on to the second, uh, also very, very important type of operations which, which is called pooling. So pooling is very similar to convolution, except that it didn't actually have a convolutional kernel matrix. So the similarity lies in that it also looks at, at a local, uh, local window of your input regardless if it's an input sequence or the feature map. Remember, feature map is the output of this convolution layer. Um, and there are predominantly two types of pooling operations, uh, but not uh, just very commonly used, but uh, by no means is complete, uh, which are the max pooling and average pooling. So let's just say for, for, for the simplicity of illustration, well, let's look at this max pooling of a pool size of two. Okay, so pool size of two means that at each step, we're looking at two base pairs, or in this specific, it's not base pair anymore because it's in the feature map. So basically two rows of this matrix, two columns of this matrix at a single time. And by max pooling, uh, that means that we take the maximum number among these two uh, input local window. In this case, it's 2.5. And the same applies to this second uh, row here is going to be 0 0.5. So I guess at this point, you should, it should be clear that the pooling operation, it will change the feature dimensions, right? 
because when you slide the two numbers becomes one, right? Two, num two numbers will take the maximum value from it, but uh, it didn't really change the channel dimension because we apply the same maximum operation um, identically to each channel. Okay, yeah. Um, even this coding process result in the most of the conversion. Right, that's, uh, that's great, yes. So it actually results in the, a loss of information, but uh, it also sparsifies your neural network. So there's always a trade-off between how your complex, if you keep all the information, you're more prone to overfitting. And uh, you actually see that in your coding implementations. You can, you're free to, uh, feel free to change different like max pooling, average pooling. And I guess a good compromise is actually the average pooling so that you don't lose information. Everything is kept, but uh, there are, depending on your input data and there are characteristics, it's, uh, it can be good or bad. Um, yeah. So after convolution and pooling, um, the last thing that is specific to a convolutional neural network is, is called uh, flatten operations. So flattening operations will basically reshape the feature map um, from a matrix to just a vector. So remember that, that after our max pooling, this is our updated uh, feature map, which is a two by two matrix. So in the most uh, simple form of flatten, we can just uh, order them differently, right? So from this two by two matrix, we can order them to a one by four vector. And this is called just a called flatten. It, it, this re doesn't result in any information loss because you just uh, reorder that so that it's a vector. Uh, but as I mentioned, sometimes you actually want to sparsify or regularize your CNN. In this case, you can do this. What you can do is global max pooling or global average pooling, right? So global average pooling is probably is very very commonly used in uh, computer vision. So basically, yeah, for each of those channel dimensions, uh, you take the average, right? So uh, in this case, 2.5 and 0 becomes 1.3, right? So in this, uh, 0 0.5 and 0 becomes uh, 0 0.3. So we take the average across uh, the channel dimension. And similarly, if you're doing this uh, max pooling, you're just taking the maximum number. So again, this may result in the most information loss, but again, it might regularize your model so that it generalizes better on the unseen data. Uh, I guess in terms of uh, take home messages, flat operators will always uh, change a matrix or uh, a tensor of uh, high dimensions to a row of vector. So now our, at this point, our input is already a vector. So this give, brings us back to this uh, um, basic form of uh, deep neural networks, just as uh, the uh, flowers case, where we actually measure the panel and sample length is a vector of input features, and we can use a fully connected set of layers uh, to model that. So, okay, so that, that concludes the, <laughs> The, the basic description of how different operations work in a CNN model. Any questions before we move on? Let me check if... Uh... Yeah, for our online audience, any questions? Okay, I hope that's clear. <laughs> so, I guess for the next uh, practice, we're actually going to implement a very simple convolutional neural network that uh, utilizes both convolution pooling flat and, and fully connected uh, in a popular deep learning framework called Keras. So before we actually move on to those coding parts, I want to briefly describe why uh, Keras is a popular choice. So Keras is probably, I think it, in my opinion, is the, the best uh, introduction to deep learning uh, because it's very fast prototype. You don't need to, uh, it's literally just five lines of code as you will see in uh, Google Colab. Um, and uh, you can just uh, build a prototype really, really quickly and uh, see if it's uh, efficient. And most of the time, if a simple model can do like 60% of the job, 
you will, you are confident that this problem is worth pursuing. If this doesn't work at all, it's probably something wrong in the previous step. For example, like your your pre pre preparing the data data set um, not uh, properly. Um, and the second uh, advantage of Keras is uh, it's actually implemented many many useful uh, utility functions that uh, can facilitate the model training and monitoring whether your model is overfitting, underfitting, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, as I guess uh, another good uh, resource is, is this website called the KP. So KP is a model zoo for genomics. It has uh, a good collection of models um, that is published during the past uh, five, 10 years. And uh, it has a good set of uh, APIs for reproducible runs for published models. And if you look at the models um, that are stored in KP, over 50% of them are actually in Keras. And that basically confirms that uh, people chose Keras for a reason because it's very easy to use. So that brings us to our practice number two, um, which is building CNNs in Keras uh, slash TensorFlow because uh, since then TensorFlow has incorporated Keras as its uh, high level API. Um, so please run this notebook till the end of section two, build a CN model using TensorFlow and Keras. I guess uh, this time I will give you slightly more time uh, to understand um, how this works and uh, hopefully change those different uh, parameter settings, observe how those uh, the input and output shapes change when you change those parameter settings. Uh, and uh, lastly, TensorBoard is one of the most powerful tools to visualize the training process. And uh, we have the privilege to have TensorBoard enabled inherently in Google Colab because apparently it's developed by Google, they want to, <laughs> they want to have it enabled. But by default, uh, this part of uh, TensorBoard is actually disabled in my, in my current notebook. So if you find the corresponding TensorBoard part uncommented and uh, try to visualize your training process, especially under different uh, hyperparameter settings, I think that will really give you a good understanding of how this works. Okay, so I also I was told that uh, at every hour we should have a break. So I think now is a good time to take a break and uh, try to digest uh, what's going on and uh, really utilize the free <laughs> resources on Google Colab and uh, try to understand both the how um, CNs work and how we can make it to work better. Okay, and we will come back at uh, three.
the general rule is that when we're in for two weeks, it's not to mention if we can have in our layers one week. That one is. Um, wait, what, what do you mean? So, like, for example, I was doing, it was originally one B, and I get an error when I said it was two B or three B. But... Yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so basically, for genomic sequencing, it's in one B. And, um, yeah. But in video. Yeah, video is just really good process for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it, this would be like one four since you're taking like two hundred minus the kernel size and then in one. But that is a good question. Yes. So the reason is that you're potting yourself same. So potting means that uh, for this left or right, if you do pot some zeros, so the same means you cut enough zeros so that the output feature map is the same shape as what well. Okay. So if you change the pattern to valid, you will be able to see you know, it. Yeah. That's something I didn't cover, but that could good catch up. Okay. <laughs>
And I guess your answer is automatic. The connection with each layer of minor. You have to make sure, like, that if the output from the one layer matches the question. That's going to be not true because of both how I did well. Oh, once we get the shape, yeah, we'll get the system. But uh, well, as we will see later in our board, it, it won't fix it for you, so you have to have to do the number of uh, conditions. Okay.
Do you guys know why this uh, projector keeps uh, disconnecting itself? Does that happen before? No. <laughs> okay. All right, so how are you doing? Uh, any more time or ready to move on? Were you able to get the TensorBot working? Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So basically, um, I guess just two points, right? So just now, um, my point was raised that uh, the shape didn't really change in terms of uh, different kernel size. Um, because uh, you know the expected size is probably we have a kernel size of uh, seven. I think you are expecting something like one ninety four, uh, but here is still two hundred. Um, the reason is that uh, in this line here, you can parse a specific argument called padding. So what padding does is uh, it will add zeros as a additional columns to your input, such that. Uh, you can actually slide this this convolutional kernel matrix outside of your original input. You can slide that to all zeros, padded, artificial, artificially padded zeros, so that th this will keep your output feature map as the same dimensionality, or the, the spatial dimensions, the same as your input. So this is what this padding does. So if you change this padding from uh, same to valid, then you will, we will see that this actually changed to 194, which is our expected uh, dimensionality. Um, and I guess the second point is that when you activate TensorBoard, by default, it will tell you this is inactive. So are you guys able to actually bypass this part? No? Yeah, so the reason is that it's, uh, it's looking for some uh, default uh, metrics that are written from uh, like TensorFlow. But in this case, we're actually uh, writing custom scalars to the disk. So what you are going to do is you go to this inactive drop down list and uh, click on custom scalars. Then this will, tell, this will show this all those documented or log training metrics during this process. So for example, you can see uh, over time, uh, this training Accuracy steadily increases, and uh, the blue line is uh, the validation accuracy. So, what is also cool about this is that you can actually look at this uh, kernels, like the change of the uh, kernel matrix. So you can see that initially, like this is uh, all around zero, right? But over time, this is uh, being changed. Uh, by the same gradient descent rule that we discussed earlier, basically at each iteration, we give it a small jiggle so that it uh, decreases the loss, or in other words, uh, increases the model's likelihood uh, or um, the consistency between the model's predicted labels and our observed labels. And then here you can very clearly see the trajectory of those kernel metrics being changed over time. Um, yeah, I think there's a, there are several like cool visualizations um, that you can probably explore offline. Um, yeah. So now let's uh, try to understand uh, what those few lines of uh, Keras code actually means. So there are two major components uh, in order to define a Keras model. The first one is model.compile. 
So uh, of course, then there's a, even before that, you need to define a model, which is this uh, sequential where you add this uh, convolutional layers, polar layers, flattened, and uh, fully connected layers. Um, I hope that was clear. So basically, it's just a Python list of layers. Uh, but after that, after the model definition, uh, there's still like two major components uh, we need to define. So the first one is called model.compile, uh, which configure its job is to configure the optimization routine. So in this function, you can parse uh, three arguments. Uh, the optimizer is basically what types of uh, optimization algorithms you're going to use. Um, so uh, most of the time, it's a stochastic gradient descent and or it's uh, different uh, variations. So if you don't know what to choose or you don't want to, you're just impatient to optimize those uh, hyperparameter, Adam is usually a good default choice. And uh, then loss function. Loss function is basically something that uh, we're minimizing against, right? So it measures how consistent or in other words, inconsistent uh, our models predicted labels are from the actual observed labels. And um, as we're optimizing using gradients, this loss function has to be differentiable with regards to the model parameters. And uh, there are a few like commonly used ones, like even though uh, like it's like a to go loss functions for different types of tasks. For example, if you are doing this classification, um, like, like we are doing here, it's zero and one, meaning like it's this, for example, this, this Protein binds to this DNA is one. If it doesn't bind, it's zero, right? It's uh, just binary. Uh, so most of the time we go with binary cross entropies. And uh, there are certain cases when we actually have a, a multi-labeled um, task. So for example, given this chunk of DNA, we have 10 different proteins. Sometimes they bind together. Sometimes only one of them binds. Sometimes none of them bind. So instead of one binary output, outcome, you will have a list of uh, like 10 different outcomes. So in those cases, we'll use this categorical cross entropy. Uh, I will cover more in the next slide, I believe. Oh, not really. <laughs> um, but anyway, so this is a, a generalization of those binary cross entropy uh, when you have a multi-class classification problem. And uh, a second major type of loss functions goes to those regression tasks. So basically those are continuous values and you want to measure um, how close your output continuous value is uh, to your observed uh, labels. And in those cases, we can use mean squared errors, uh, which is uh, short, uh, shortened as MSE or mean absolute errors. Um, and finally, we can also provide a list of uh, metrics. So those metrics are provides additional control and monitors for your model's uh, training behaviors over time. Uh, they do not have to be differentiable uh, with regards to the parameters. This is a major difference uh, compared to the loss. So apparently you can parse loss as one of those param metrics. Um, so an example for this is uh, area under a receiver operating curves, um, which we will cover mostly uh, yeah, later today. But uh, this metric is not differentiable with respect to the parameters, but uh, a lot of times it actually provides a better understanding of your model's behavior. I guess to, just to wrap it up, uh, during this model.compile, you basically specify how you want to optimize your model parameters. And then you can call this model.fit, uh, which is this, perhaps the most important function in this whole training process, uh, which will uh, parse it some data and train the model parameters. So here you also need to parse a few uh, arguments. So batch size controls how many samples, data points, samples, or feature label pairs, they all refer to the same thing. Uh, the model will see at each step. Okay, so it's a mini batch um, of uh, labeled data points. And the epochs, the epoch is how many epochs to train um, to train your model. And uh, the definition of epoch is basically when you iterate through your entire training data by the size of your batch size, uh, this is called one epoch. And uh, finally, we also have some uh, callbacks. So callbacks are specific 
type of functions that will always be called after upon an epoch is finished. So there are several very useful uh, callback functions in Keras. So the one that we already used is this uh, TensorBot callback. So what it does is uh, at the upon finish of each training epoch, uh, this function will examine the model, document the model's performance to disk so that we, later we can visualize that using TensorBot uh, utilities. And uh, there are two additionally very, very commonly used uh, callback functions that are model checkpoints, which will, upon training, finish the completion of a training cycle, will save the current model parameters to your local disk. So you can um, load that in a later time point. And early stopping is uh, comes back to our point that why we want to have this validation data set. So basically at each training, upon completion of a training epoch, uh, we can examine the model's performance on this held out validation data set. So if it doesn't increase until our model's preset patience runs out, we'll actually stop training, which is that is earlier than the specified, specified epochs. That is why it's called early stopping. Um, so, so in the next step, I guess, yeah, before that, any questions regarding to the Keras training functions? I know you have already like run it, it runs uh, okay, and you have uh, give it some uh, tweaks, but uh, just to just so we understand uh, what's actually like each line is doing, and um, yeah, any questions before we move on to PyTorch? Okay. So I guess now we are going to move from Keras to PyTorch, which is, uh, as I said, it's uh, getting, really getting popularity, it's taking over everything, uh, especially in research. And uh, it gives you more control over uh, the nuances of your deep learning model. But uh, as a trade-off, it also doesn't impl implement so many things for you. So you have to specify uh, the input and output shapes um, and for a lot of, say, this uh, TensorBoard and uh, Matrix, you have to actually use external uh, Python packages on build on top of PyTorch. So I guess now uh, let's run this uh, section three of uh, our Jupyter Notebook that is uh, building a CNN using PyTorch and PyTorch Lightning. And then uh, in 10 minutes, we'll come back and uh, discuss how uh, the, the underlying code logistics uh, of using PyTorch to build CNNs. And also a quick note is that uh, these two models are, are built to be identical to each other. So uh, you can probably actually map um, the corresponding functionalities in Keras to PyTorch, even though the code is, may look a lot more complex. So we will have uh, 10 minutes. That's right. Yes, that's a great question. So, uh, PyTorch Lightning um, wraps uh, the conventional PyTorch by adding these training loops. So, basically, I wrote a comment in, in, in the code block that basically everything before that comment is the same between PyTorch Lightning and the uh, ordinal PyTorch. Anything after that is specific to PyTorch Latin, and I'll explain why that's the case.
Okay. Yeah, that's actually coded by the forward function. Yes. So I guess I'll just uh, briefly go over this part uh, because you know if you just run it, it seems uh, pretty tedious and um, straightforward. Uh, just to understand how Hatch uh, typically works. So in order to feed those uh, data from the non-high arrays to your model, we first need to build those uh, data sets, Hatch data sets. All right. So uh, you can construct those uh, different types of data sets using different uh, uh, classes in this specific case because our uh, input data is actually fairly small, so we can just uh, construct this in memory data sets by calling this uh, tensor data set. Um, so this is a number one difference because in Keras we just parse the numpy uh, numpy arrays as input, but what's happening under the hood is actually uh, their Keras is constructing those data set and data loader for us. Um, you just like you don't get to expose to it, so it's easier at a first try. But uh, if you want a more control, fine grain controls for your data loaders, um, they actually you have to dig deeper uh, into the same. They basically work the same way. And uh, again, like we can control the batch size here, uh, which is the thing that we passed for to Keras um, model dot fit. Um, and then another significant difference is that. Uh, PyTorch works by subclassing um, the torch mod touch dot n dot module, or in this case, uh, PyTorch Latin dot Latin module, right? So you define all those tensor operations, uh, and together with their parameters, and when you init this uh, custom uh, model class, right? So this is uh, almost the same to our Keras sequential. Uh, you define those. Uh, uh, layers one by one, but uh, notably the most uh, no, the most notable feature uh, here is that you can define the output channels and uh, later on when you actually um, define a fully connected layer, you need to know that your the input features uh, dimensionality is actually thirty two, right? So in Keras, uh, the input features are computed automatically for you, but here. You need to keep keep track of uh, how these shapes will change uh, in this layer by layer cases uh, throughout the program, and this is what, precisely why uh, I put so much emphasis on understanding how the shapes will change. Um, and then in Keras, we did uh, accuracy and AORLC as the um, as the training matrix. So basically, uh, at uh, upon completion of each training epoch. Uh, Keras will compute this accuracy and ORC for us. But here, uh, PyTorch is, uh, in a sense, is a minimalist. It just defines the, uh, the, all the tensors in your model. So if we want to actually compute these metrics, what we do is we use a second package called uh, Torch matrix, uh, where they have implemented accuracy and ORC for us. Yeah. Uh, so actually, BCE loss is a binary cross entropy, right? Yes. So that's the yeah. That's a yeah. That's a good question. So basically, that's this maps to the loss function that in Keras we which we call it as a binary cross entropy. Um, yeah. So basically, in this uh, init, when you initialize your custom model class, you define all those tensors, and then you have to define uh, a second function which is called forward. So in forward, you will tell, uh, basically tell PyTorch how those different layers um, are sued together, right? One after one. Um, 
So that to answer your question, how do you make a prediction? Basically, you can run forward, give it a, a, a X of a, as argument, and this for by running this forward pass, uh, this will generate uh, the output, the predicted predictions. Uh, and uh, up until this part, it's identical between PyTorch and PyTorch Latin. Anything comes below this is a uh, specific to PyTorch Latin. And this is for a reason because PyTorch only defines the model for you. If you want to train your model, like for example, define how many epochs you want to train. And uh, by the end of each epoch, you want to do this, uh, uh, compute this matrix, uh, you will have to do, write your own functions. And uh, apparently that's not ideal because the training loops will really occur every time you train a model. So that's why like we utilize PyTorch Latin uh, to, to complete this training loop for us. And there are some additional uh, benefits for using PyTorch Latin because for example, like it can automatically uh, manage the devices. Sometimes you may put your data loader on CPU while your model is on GPU. That will apparently throw an error because uh, different objects are different uh, on different devices. So by using PyTorch Lightning, this will all be taken care of. Uh, so in order to use this, again, uh, we have to specify a few additional things. So this configure optimizers can be translated to model.compile, right? So basically we specify that we're using Adam as our optimizer. Um, and uh, this step function, turn step, validation step, test step, and all, uh, all epoch end are all implemented so that we can match this fit, model.fit in Keras. So basically you want to specify at each training step what you do, right? So what you do is you make this Red Hat, which is the predictions generated by uh, the forward function. Then you compute the loss between your predictions and the true values, you store that, and then you compute all those different metrics. So um, I guess, as I mentioned, PyTorch gives you a lot of more granularities in terms of controlling your model's behavior, but a lot of times it's also added complexities. Um, I guess in a, in a nutshell, uh, everything, this one maps to model.compile and uh, all the rest of the like step, training step, uh, epoch n maps to model.fit in Keras language. Yeah, so in general, I think PyTorch requires uh, slightly more uh, requirements for Python programming. You need to understand how those uh, like inheritance between different classes works. Um, and you need to define a lot more uh, like operators and also you can define, keep track of uh, how the shape changes um, be between layers. Um, yeah, so I guess I, I read those, like, can you match the Py PyTorch code? And basically I just did that for you. So yeah, I hope you, uh, now we have a basic understanding of how, you know, like regardless of uh, deep learning frameworks, what's, uh, what, what are the basic uh, components in terms of defining a CNN model. So now that we have two models implemented in different deep learning frameworks, we need, to, we need to make a comparison between them. And this is typically the case when you have multiple CNN models by tuning some proper parameters, how do we choose one, the best one, right? So that brings us to uh, the last uh, section for today, which is model evaluations. So evaluation is basically is essential to provide us a feedback of how the model is doing and how we can make them better, right? So for classification tasks, um, I would like to group this evaluations into two categories. So first is called this discrete type of uh, evaluations where you will use a threshold to binarize your predictions into zeros and ones. And then you can, can compute the consistency uh, between those uh, binary predicted labels and uh, binary um, observed labels. In the second type, we'll keep those predicted scores as continuous. Basically, we can rank those predictions based on the magnitude of your prediction and then compute the prediction consistency across multiple thresholds. 
Um, yeah, I guess I have a question for you guys. Is uh, if you have uh, taken the workshop of uh, machine learning with Python, I hope this is not new to you, or is it? Anyway, I'll just uh, briefly go through this. So, for for this uh, discrete prediction evaluations, basically most of the time we'll cut off the prediction at zero point five, right? So anything that is larger than fifty percent becomes one. Anything that are lower than fifty percent becomes zero. And then this then we can define those uh, true positive rate, false positive rate, true negative rate, false negative rate, or like a balanced uh, accuracy such as a F one score. I'm just omitting all those definitions because you can find all of that in Wikipedia or any good resources that are, that are out there. Um, but here I'm just uh, going to emphasize one particularly good analysis of realization, which is the confusion matrix. So this is especially useful when you have multiple uh, multiple classes. Like as I mentioned, you have, we have the same chunk of DNA, but we have 10 different proteins. One of the bands to this and one bind to that. Or uh, in this uh, image classifications, we can classify a handwritten digit into one of those uh, uh, one through nine uh, digits, right? So we can visualize those uh, confusion matrix to see uh, which types of classes are typically confused with uh, another class. And in this case, we can see uh, our model tends to predict zeros uh, pretty well, right? But uh, for a lot of ones, uh, they're actually predicted uh, less frequently as a uh, positive. Um, but this, uh, again, this has an obvious uh, problem because uh, we're setting an artificial threshold of 50%, uh, uh, which may not always be optimal. So um, most of the cases, a continuous prediction evaluation is, uh, in my opinion, is a uh, preferred. So basically you can compare those, uh, for example, in this case is uh, AURLC, you can compare the sensitivity and the false positive rate by moving across this line, right? So each dot is one threshold. Um, I guess I will skip all those technical details, but and just say that uh, AURLC of a point Y is a perfect classifier. Basically at each time point, it always gives you the uh, true positives without introducing any false positives. And uh, AURC of 0.5 is a random, like completely flipping coins to make a prediction um, for a binary classification. And uh, anyone knows why AURC can't be lower than 0.5? Yeah, so if you have a really bad classifier, that means uh, it's even worse than random, right? So in that case, you can basically just flip the predictions. So basically, whenever a prediction, a predictor says it's one, you change that to zero, and the uh, predicts zero change that to one, then you automatically get a very good predictor. This is why URCs cannot be smaller than 0.5. Um, Okay, so now we have a good sense. We have a list of uh, metrics to evaluate different models. Um, it's always important to you know save your work and be able to resume uh, at a later time point. So this this is what this model save and load does. So since we uh, introduced the two types of uh, deep learning frameworks, I'm going to introduce how you can save and reload the model uh, in both Keras and PyTorch. So again, in, Py in Keras, it's uh, fairly straightforward as it uh, always is in Keras. So you can call model.save and basically save that to, to a file on your local disk. And uh, later on, you can just uh, call TensorFlow Keras models load model and then give it the file name that you just uh, saved. The disk automatically reloads all the weights back to this new model. Uh, in PyTorch, if you're using PyTorch Lightning, this will be easier because you can save model checkpoints and then reload it in a way that's very similar um, to Keras. So that brings us to our last practice for today, which is uh, model evaluations. 
So please run sections three to five uh, till the end of the notebook. And uh, for the practice, I guess you can try to understand what each line PyTorch CNN model does. Um, I guess I just explained it uh, to you in my language, but uh, hopefully you will get a better understanding. And uh, right now the model's performance is less than ideal as uh, evaluated by those metrics we just introduced. So you should try to see if you can improve the performance by tweaking of the hyperparameters with model architectures. And uh, yeah, we'll have uh, ten, another 10 minutes before we wrap, wrap up this uh, workshop. And uh, this will be probably the last chance to ask any remaining questions, if you have any. I get so yeah the problem is that uh, again your question is on the former uh not higher rate right but you will have to yeah use it as well so why don't you try like first off next year and then just wrap it to the parentheses and see if that works? So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, we'll come back to this uh, tomorrow. Um, with uh, Yes, with a slightly more straightforward way. I guess in a way, PyTorch is just, uh, it gives you a, a really, really good backbone, but uh, you just need to re implement several things um, whenever you start a new project. This, this is why the PyTorch button as a Python package becomes really, really popular because you don't have to write new like, prediction function or uh, fit function on your single time. Yeah, this way, yeah. see, let's go. Oh, I think it changes it. Yeah, how can change it? And this is, this is the kind of something that I thought I think does for you because we're doing this uh, at like the data loader when you get. Fast data from data loader to your model. Uh, yeah, we can make sure that they're of the same type. So yeah, I'll just show you here. So basically, um, if, a, if a custom model class inherits from uh, either charge.nn.module or PyTorch lightning module, uh, it, the call method of the model, basically is you, you model touch, if you just uh, give it a, an argument, this direct always rolls to the forward. Basically they have the same behavior. And uh, in this case, you want to wrap this task data set in another data set and data loader. And then uh, basically if you do this or you don't have this forward, they be their behavior is the same. So at each time you want to parse this batch at the zero index because we, all, we only need the, the features, not the labels. Um, and then again, you need to do this device management you need to detach that from the computing graph and then convert that from C GPU to CPU and then convert that from uh, NumPy, uh, from tensor to NumPy. So this is what this uh, list of things does. And you will typically see that in a lot of uh, um, PyTorch implementations. So basically this is the way of uh, doing inference. 
uh, using PyTorch models. Yep. So batch zero is like putting all of the testing results into one, like being ever aggregating uh, You mean here? Yes. Yeah, so still like this, uh, see like we still specified the batch size. So each time it's still like 64 data points. And uh, each data point is a pair, is a tuple of a feature and labels. And uh, batch zero is just like we're passing the features instead of, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's why like we have this for loop to complete this, uh, like iterate through all those class data points. And in the end, we can concatenate them um, as a NumPy array. Yeah, but once you are familiar with that, it's actually more powerful. It's just it's more like changeable. Um, yeah, it just gives you more granular and uh, for some historical reasons as well. So Keras was uh, developed for multi to support multiple backends, including TensorFlow and the uh, and uh, I believe Cafe at one point as well. At that point, all those major um, deep learning frameworks uses this concept called the static computing graphs. So basically you have to define the entire uh, computation graph first, like uh, each layer, this layer does this, this layer does this, and then push that all at once to GPU. And this makes debugging extremely hard <laughs> because you don't get to see what's actually being pushed to GPU. Yeah. So, but uh, PyTorch at the time uh, was using this dynamic computation graph. Uh, where you can access the values of each tensor immediately without like this extra step of uh, pushing that all at once to GPUs. So that's why like over time, uh, PyTorch was getting a lot of popularities. But uh, since TensorFlow 2, they start to adapt this dynamic computation graph as well. So nowadays, these tools are really um, quite similar. I mean, in terms of the backend, not on the Keras part. Keras is still great. Um, yeah, but you know, like the lost grounds by TensorFlow cannot be recovered. So, so PyTorch is still really, really popular. All right, so. I guess um, that's mostly the things that we will cover for today. Um, just to summarize, I hope uh, we have a, have a basic understanding of how CNNs work, especially for genomic sequences. So as you might have um, noticed, uh, just by changing this 1D layer names to 2D and 3D, you can extend this from uh, genomic sequences to images or to videos. So implementation wise, it's uh, like it's very consistent. It's very uh, straightforward to extend. And uh, using 1D as the case study to understand the convolution, I think it's, uh, it's just uh, probably the best entry point. And uh, we've uh, built CNNs using both TensorFlow or more precisely Keras um, and uh, PyTorch. And uh, we introduced a certain uh, model evaluation matrix so that we can compare different uh, model qualities. And uh, for tomorrow, we'll be mostly covering the, uh, uh, framework agnostic CNN models so that we want to build, uh, we want to build a CNN model that is uh, identical to both Keras and uh, PyTorch uh, using the simple language of Keras, but also have this uh, dynamic computation graph benefits uh, as in PyTorch. And uh, the other thing is uh, you might have noticed uh, from this, from our evaluations, is that our current model only achieves an AURC of, uh, I think it's 0 0.8. Actually, yeah, 0 0.8. So um, for tomorrow, we will actually define a group of models by constructing a model space 
and then we can effectively search a best performing model that within five minutes, um, so that uh, we, that can in increase the AUC from 0 0.8 to 0 0.99, 0.99. <laughs> it's basically yeah, perfect. Um, and uh, this is entirely done automatically and efficiently. But uh, you are, you're welcome to you know, try different operators and see if you can actually find a better model than the one we currently defined uh, in the notebook. And I believe that's probably one of the extended practice uh, questions. And uh, just, just one last point. Uh, I know that at the beginning I mentioned for whoever is taking this for cross credits, um, they're required to do those extended practices. But for other people who are interested, uh, please feel free to send me your results and uh, I'll be happy to provide feedback. Okay, so that's, uh, that concludes our workshop for today. We're ending a little earlier than expected, but I hope um, those are good uh, free time and uh, you can use that for practice. Wait, say that again. So like, what's the deadline for the meeting? Oh, it's next Friday. Okay. Um, yes. And uh, each day we'll have uh, five extended practices and uh, they're weighted equally, 10 points per practice, a total of 100. Um, yeah, they'll be graded and um, count towards your final report. Yeah. All right, for people who are online, I feel there are no more questions. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome.